So um, the cell structure lab, this is our group, is interested in the interactions of viruses, cells, as Oscar described. And we are studying a number of um, biological problems or um, projects related to this, such as the architecture of RNA virus factories, the biogenesis of replication complexes in cell membranes for RNA viruses, also the viral morphogenetic pathways. Uh, actually, we come from this field, the, the viral morphogenesis and assembly. And more recently, we incorporated this project trying to understand why arboviruses do not kill uh, cells from the vectors, from mosquito or arthropods, but they rapidly kill human cells. So to know more about all these uh, biological models or uh, these projects to develop them, we have incorporated a number of microscopy techniques during the last 10 years, such as live cell microscopy, correlative microscopy, that is to select a particular cell, a particular structure, uh, in a live cell, a live microscopy, and to study it at high resolution electron microscopy. Also electron tomography for 3D reconstruction and 3D analysis of whole cells. And much more recently, molecular mapping of the complex volumes generated by electron tomography using clonable tags for EM, something like the GFP, but for uh, ultrastructure. So we work with virus factories and these were first described for the big DNA viruses that uh, replicate in the cytosol of the infected cells, such as pox viruses or African swine fever virus. It was mostly the work of Tom Weileman in UK, and they described what it could be just the first uh, signaling pathway identified in cells and used for viruses to build the whole factories, which is the agrosome formation. So agrosomes are uh, structures very complex structures induced by, by the cell when they have some kind of a stress. Uh, when you have a cell under stress, what happens is that a lot of misfolding proteins and they can aggregate and to form inclusion bodies that are toxic for the cell. So the cell responds to defend itself, bringing all these inclusion bodies to the microtubular organizing center and, it, and they surround all these aggregates with vimenting cages this element of the cytoskeleton. So all these inclusion bodies get enclosed there to be there just waiting for better times. <coughs> if the stress disappears, the vimenting cages open up and the situation is recovered. So it, it looks like, and I think they, they did a very good demonstration that this is uh, actually like this, that these DNA viruses use the agresome pathway to concentrate the many proteins and factors they need for replication and morphogenesis. And more recently, there are some kind of evidence that RNA viruses do the same, but there is not uh, one single paper demonstrating this. But vimenting cages are also observed for RNA virus factories. We have been working with RNA virus factories for 10 years now, and what we visualize is something similar, but these are membranes and mitochondria surrounding the areas of replication and assembly. This is common for almost any kind of virus that builds factory. They recruit mitochondria and uh, endomembranes. So how a virus factory is built? It involves uh, major changes in the whole cell structure. It's not just local changes, but the whole ultrastructure of the cell is modified. For example, we have here control cells, BHK21 cell culture. We have labeled the nuclei in blue. They are round shape. You see the Golgi in red is surrounding the nuclei and in green, we have the actin stress fibers. Soon after infection, this is what we have. So nuclei have changed a lot. They are elongated now. The actin has been removed towards the cell periphery, and the Golgi has changed completely. It's now a round-shaped structure on one side of the nucleus. If we look just at the nuclei, we see that they are round-shaped in old cells, and they are like this in an infected cell with kind of a cavity where the factory is located. So the whole cell organization has, has completely changed. Excuse me, what virus was that? This is a Banja virus. I, I will describe it now. Yes. So at high magnification, you can see here that the Golgi has changed dramatically. It's uh, partly fragmented, but it's concentrated here while actin has been removed. So 
These factories are built by Banja viruses. These are uh, the largest family of animal viruses. They include, they are mostly arboviruses transmitted between mammals and humans by a mosquito bite or a tick. And they cause, some of the members of the family cause very serious pathologies, some encephalitis or hemorrhagic fever, similar to Ebola, but this is a, a different family. So these are RNA viruses with three ribonucleoproteins of RNA of negative polarity and the membrane of the virus, the envelope, comes from the Golgi. The Golgi is indeed the central element of the whole factory. And we were first characterizing the morphogenetic pathway of the virus. We could demonstrate that the virus builds these immature particles on the this side of the Golgi by budding and then moves towards the trans side and the particle change the structure. This depends on the acquisition of complex sugars in the glycoproteins of the envelope. And there is a second change when the cell exits the cell. When, uh, sorry, the virus exits the cells. The second change consists in the reorganization of the glycoproteins of the envelope that build the spikes. So these are the mature spikes that are able to recognize the receptor to infect the cell. So this is what we were doing with these viruses because we were interested in the interaction of viruses with the secretory pathway. But what happens before? Uh, morphogenesis is the end, let's say the, the last moment when the virus took control of the cell and succeeded in replicate and then uh, assemble new particles. So we started to look at earlier times post-infection before morphogenesis takes place. And we found evidences of the formation of a factory. This is the rough endoplasmic reticulum in red. And early after infection, it surrounds the viral factory. If we take a look uh, by electron microscopy to these areas, what we saw was this. There are no viral particles in the Golgi jets, well, just very few. But we saw these tubular structures, these cylinders. They are indeed a cylinder with a big domain on one of the sides and we isolated them for a characterization at the biochemical and structural level. So this study was long, but we could demonstrate that the replication of the virus is here in the big globular domain. We found all the factors needed for uh, genome replication there. And then the cylinder was indeed an scaffold of protein constituted by actin, cell actin, and a non-structural protein, viral NSM. They are indeed two scaffolding proteins that assist in the formation of the immature viral particle and then this disappear. They are no longer present in the mature period. If we destroy this scaffold here, we just were peeling off the structure, removing the membranes. But if we destroy the whole cylinder, we see the release of many ribonucleoproteins. So we think that the replication takes place here and then the assembly of the ribonucleoproteins and protection from the environment takes place in the cylinder. So we said, OK, we have cylinders in the organelles that construct, that make the construction of the factory. But to know more about how this could be working, we wanted to know uh, how is the structure in three dimensions, how the whole, uh, the, all, the all the elements of the factory get together. And for that, we have to make a transition from the traditional way to look at cells at the electron microscopy, to, which is random sectioning. So usually we do this, and we used to do this uh, for any kind of uh, structure we wanted to visualize in cells, which is, OK, we have the cell monolayer. We fix the cells. We make a pellet. And the pellet is embedded in a resin, a plastic resin, to section there, uh, to make very thin sections of 50 nanometers to bring it to the electron microscope. This means that cells here are oriented in, in many different ways. And when we section, we are just random sectioning. Uh, cells are huge, so we can be missing information. And indeed, this is what happened. We realized that when orienting the sectioning and um, processing the cells in the same way they, they are, this shape in the monolayer. So we have here these pieces of plastic. The cells grow on them. And we process the cells the same way we fix them, and we process them the same way uh, shape and dimensions uh, in the monolayer where they were alive. So this way, we can choose the orientation of our sections. We can just proceed uh, in sections parallel to the base of the cell, 
or perpendicular to the cell. And we could find here, for example, that the replication complexes were not 2, 3 per cell, as we thought, but 50 to 100. So we were missing a lot of information by random sectioning. And this way we did the reconstruction of the whole cell. How we do it? We collect all the sections of the monolayer in, in order, we have to be sure which is the one and the last one. And these small blue pieces are the sections. And then we have to apply a number of, uh, we go to the microscope, we take the images of the same cell in all the planes, and we have to apply a number of um, processing steps. For example, BSoft is just to give to all the sections the same level of information, contrast and brightness to, to have all of them with the same weight in the reconstruction. Then we do the alignment with this program, Reconstruct. That means that we have to place, we do it by pairs, two sections. We select a good number of spots in each section and the following one, just to put them one on top of the other. We have to choose many spots because the structures change from one plane to another. And to minimize the mistake we can make, we have to choose many spots and to put all of them on register. And then we do the segmentation and 3D visualization with Amira. Segmentation is just to assign particular identities to all the structures we are looking at. So we do it with the previous knowledge about how a mitochondria looks like or how the rough endoplasmic reticulum. It happens that sometimes some elements, we don't know what they are because sometimes these structures are induced by the virus. But to be conservative, everything we don't know what they are, we do not include them in the reconstruction. Okay? So we just choose what we know what they are. So uh, this is the result of an early factory reconstruction. This is the whole factory. could have three microns in diameter, more or less. This is uh, equivalent to what we see by confocal microscopy, a round shape a structure near the nucleus. All the mitochondria surround the structure. Also the rough endoplasmic reticulum in yellow here in beige is the Golgi. The Golgi has changed polarity, so we do not have the stacks with the this side looking to the nucleus anymore. So they are circularized. They just are removed and circularized. <coughs> and one of the things we observed in the early factory is that the tubes, the, the tubes that contain the replication complex of the virus, were the physical link between the different organelles recruited there. They are always inserted in the Golgi, but they touch the rough endoplasmic reticulum and the mitochondria. So somehow these uh, structures are not only the replication complex, but the physical connections between the elements in the factory. If we go later in infection, when we have the production of lots of viral particles, the situation changes, as you can see. So the rind shaped structure is no longer located here in the cavity near the nucleus. The mitochondria are moving away. The membranes of the rough endoplasmic reticulum are moving away. At the same time, the particles, the viral particles here segmented in blue, look for the way to get out of the cell for secretion. And in this kind of reconstructions, we observed numerous interactions between the tubes and new uh, the forming viral particles. This was also important to understand, because if we have the replication in one structure, the assembly site has to be nearby, otherwise the RNA should be traveling a long distance to, to find the assembly site. So they are really very close to the replication complexes. So you see here these colorful 3D reconstructions, but the real information is in the planes. When we go to the analysis through the uh, study of all the planes, we really understand the structure. So, and, and we catch interactions and events that were totally missed in two-dimensional analysis because somehow our brain is not prepared to understand a three-dimensional structure from single planes. But if you go through the analysis of all of them, we understand much more how things are connected. So the 3D reconstruction is just a colorful model, but the old information that we, we could extract from the reconstructions come from the planes, okay? So this work was the base of this model. We are working with this model now. And uh, actin and myosin were localized in these structures, in the tubes, by peptide mapping in the isolated tubes. We analyzed all the cell proteins that were enriched there. And actin and myosin 1 were one of them. So we used some drugs to understand if they were participating in the movement of ribonucleoproteins. And we found that, well, 
most likely actin and myosin, this complex, are moving the newly uh, formed ribonucleoproteins from the replication complex towards the assembly side of the Golgi complex to, to do all the, the formation of the new particles. But anyway, we are still working to have a more direct functional evidence that this is working like that. But we have uh, some indirect evidence that this can happen. For example, with drugs for myosin, the heads get full of fibers. They are not able to get out of there, most likely, the ribonucleoproteins. So these three reconstructions and all the analysis um, and the technical development to incorporate them show us something. Uh, the 3D reconstruction from individual planes uh, render a very good resolution in the XY axis, something like three, four, five nanometers, which is good for cell structure. But the problem is in the theta axis. The alignment always has imperfections. We are not able to make a perfect alignment of planes because of what I was telling you before, structures change from, from one plane to another. So this alignment is not perfect. And this decreased the resolution in the theta axis to 50 nanometers, more or less. So it's very modest, the resolution. So, well, then we decided to move to electron tomography. This is a method that is, um, well, it's a real revolution in cell structure and structural biology in general since 10, 12 years ago. And the principle is very different. So, Usually in electron microscopy for 3D reconstruction of specimens, the strategy was single particle reconstruction. For example, I have many identical viruses, many identical uh, macromolecular complexes. So I take images of thousands of them, and then I make a reconstruction to have a 3D model. So that 3D model will be more perfect and with higher resolution if I, I am able to collect more and more identical particles. But this is not possible with a cell with a non-symmetrical virus or with an organelle with non-symmetrical structures. The solution has been electron tomography. And the principle of this method that is based in electron microscopy is that I'm reconstructing just one single object. So I have an object here, could be a cell, could be a non-symmetrical virus, a mitochondrion, for example. And I introduce it in the microscope and I do the tilting of the structure so from minus 70 degrees to plus 70 cannot be more because of the goniometer of the microscope does not allow higher angles. So I take all the images from one minus seven to plus seven. Every one or two degrees I take an image. So I have lots of projections, different views of the structure that then I do a reconstruction by back projection and I get a 3D reconstruction of the object. So Resolution of electron tomography is similar to reconstru reconstruction of single planes, three, five nanometers, but in all directions. There is no problem in particular directions like the theta, theta axis in, in serial sections. Uh, experts in tomography uh, well understand that two, nan two nanometer resolution is affordable, that with uh, more improvements in the microscopes and the image processing programs, we can reach two nanometers. Two nanometers mean that we can do the docking of high resolution data coming, for example, from X-ray crystallography into the tomograms. And this will be really, well, something has been done already, it's published, and that will give a lot of information at the molecular level, how molecules make uh, cellular structures, which is very interesting. So people understand that uh, this can help us to a quantitative description of the macromolecular interactions that underlie cellular function. This is the, the big goal, very ambitious, but uh, well, things are in going in that direction. So electron tomography has been with us for a number of years now, but uh, the big papers and the big results that really uh, cause uh, mm, an increase in the number of people dedicated to that in the electron microscopy labs come from 10 years ago, more or less. And the laboratory of Wolf and Baumeister in the Max Planck Institute in Germany is the leading laboratory in these techniques. He was the person who understood uh, what was important in all the way from the preservation of the sample to 3D reconstruction. And, and well, all the best results come from this lab, although nowadays there are many, many people working in tomography. So we have been able to know more about viruses by electron tomography. For example, herpeviruses were a collaboration between Wolfram and Meister and Alastair Steven in the States. 
they could analyze the structure of the whole particle, even these uh, tegument proteins, they localize actin in actin fibers, not actin, uh, I mean filaments inside. Vaccinia was the second virus reconstructed. It was, that was a collaboration of several groups of my institute and also Wolfram von Meister. And we could see very interesting features in the core. For example, the existence of channels because nobody understood how this particle enters a cell and then you have the intact core for a long time, how the, the virus takes control of the cell. Well, there are channels big enough for the export of uh, messenger RNA. So the, the particle was in communication all the time with the cytosol. And also some other viruses such as flu, HIV here, Banja viruses, etc. So the big challenge has been to move into cells because cells are much more complex than macromolecular complexes of viruses. But the group of Maumeister again started to analyze uh, live bacteria. I mean, bacteria vitrified uh, when they were alive and bringing them to electron tomography showed that some bacteria, for example, spiroplasma, have a cytoskeleton that was all the time people thought that bacteria have a cytoskeleton, but was never visualized before going into tomography. Or for example, this work that probably was the breakthrough in the field, Actually, this paper was chosen as one of the breakthroughs of the year in 2002 by science. This is the first visualization of part of a new eukaryotic cell by electron tomography. This is an amoeba that is working on a substrate, vitrified when this, this cell was alive. And the very thin areas of the cytosol, when the, the cell is moving, were analyzed by electron tomography. What they saw was some uh, new features of the actin cy cytoskeleton. Actin is always tricky to analyze in cells. They could see that the filaments here in red have some branches, and they also define particular interactions with the plasma membrane. And what it was really interesting was to localize some macromolecular complexes that were very similar to others that people knew by high resolution methods. So that was the first indication that maybe we can localize uh, proteins in cells uh, vitrified in the state where they were alive. So that's really very interesting. Of course, when we move to the interesting areas of a eukaryotic cell, for example, the perinuclear area where we have the Golgi and all the membranes uh, interacting, things are really complicated. This is the work of the group of uh, Macintosh in Boulder, Colorado. That's the American group doing a lot of uh, very good things in electron tomography. And here, the problem is segmentation. How can you give an, an identity to so many structures in a live cell? So computing a work, I mean, the development of methods for interpretation is really uh, the challenge now to understand the tomograms. So when we move into electron tomography, because we wanted to know more about our virus factories, we are doing it with Vanja viruses, but also with this virus. And I prefer to show these results because factories of rubella virus are more simple to analyze than Vanja viruses. Rubella virus is an RNA virus the, uh, of positive polarity, heteratogenic human pathogen, and it builds factories around modified lysosomes of the infected cell. So the lysosome contains the replication complexes of the virus, and this structure recruits the rough endoplasmic reticulum, mitochondria, and also Golgi, because assembly of this virus is also in Golgi membranes. So when applying uh, very high preservation methods, such as high pressure freezing, we could see that the structure that we have visualized by conventional processing was much more complex. So inside the modified lysosome, there are many membranes uh, interacting to each other. And this is the type of structures we are uh, bringing to electron tomography. We are doing this with, not with infected cells, but with cells transfected with replicons. We could see that uh, just transfecting the cells with these replicons, we can recover uh, replication complexes and viral factories that are identical to those formed during the normal infection. They are active for replication, as shown here with double standard RNA antibodies, and they recruit all the elements of the factory they recruit lots of mitochondria. The whole periphery of the lysosome is full of mitochondria, as we can see here, by freeze fracture. And another thing we did was also to know which proteins of the virus were inside. And this is just to show you that the uh, modified lysosomes are not spheres. 
they have this side view. So if we section the, the structures with this type of side view, we see that all of them have a straight element. It's a very rigid membrane where the replicase is located, also the replicase is in the vesicles and vacuoles. But these are really two-dimensional uh, protein membranes. We have evidences that the, probably the replicases are concentrating there to form some kind of a crystal, a two-dimensional organization of the replicase. This was proposed some time ago by Carla Kierkegaard working with polioviruses. There's an idea that the RNA viruses uh, anchor the replicases in uh, membranes of the cell to make a more efficient uh, process of replication. But it seems that these complexes are very well organized and probably they are um, forming some kind of crystals for a more efficient, people say, process of replication. So this is what we have done. We have done high pressure freezing. This is the best method that we have today to vitrify the whole eukaryotic cell, something so big, without any kind of chemical pretreatment. So we want to preserve things uh, in a close to native state, okay? So, uh, of course, it's not possible to vitrify it with the formation of ice crystals that would destroy the structure, a whole eukaryotic cell at atmospheric pressure. It would be destroyed completely with ice crystals. But uh, high pressure freezing devices uh, apply a trick. So if we can coordinate the moment of freezing with the application of a very high pressure to the sample, something like 2,000 times the atmospheric pressure, the water of the sample becomes so viscous that it's not able to crystallize. So we have vitrification uh, in the absence of <coughs> any kind of crystal, but at very low uh, speeds, something like 200 Celsius per second compared to 10,000 Celsius per second we do with the small particles. So high pressure freezing is absolutely mandatory when we do high resolution, when we can really go into molecular identification and high resolution. And then we just embed the samples in a resin, we section them, and we collect them in this kind of uh, grids. These are holy carbon grids, just to have enough support for the sections and maximum contrast uh, here on the holes. And we just look at the sections and choose these areas for tomography, that means the tilting and 3D reconstruction. So if we go to the end of the process, just to see the colorful 3D map of the whole structure, this is very complicated to understand. I mean, we have even applying certain um, filters and thresholds. That means that we are not displaying 100% of mass we have here, but just the most neat information, the, the sharp uh, information. We can say, well, we can say a number of things that the rough endoplasmic reticulum surrounds the whole structure, that we have molecules in between, that we have also a lot of things going on here, but this is very complicated. So the same uh, thing we were explaining about the serial section reconstruction, tomograms are always studied uh, choosing different computational planes, two nanometers computational planes, and we do the analysis of, of all the planes individually to understand where we have contacts and what's the, the structure, how is the, the organization of the whole structure. And then we go to the 3D reconstruction. But first, we have to analyze all the planes of the 3D volume, the reconstructed volume. And for example, we have seen that the lysosome, or cytopathic vacuole, that is, is, is known as that, touches the rough endoplasmic reticulum with two types of interaction. Closely opposed membranes, so we never see fusion of membranes. Membranes get together, but they never fuse. And these protein bridges that are very interesting in structures, they are identical in dimensions to these complexes of mitofusins. Mitofusins are uh, proteins involved in the interaction between mitochondria and mitochondria and rough endoplasmic reticulum, but people say that probably they are involved in communication between more organelles. So we are trying to know if we have here mitofusins. And indeed, people knew that the rough endoplasmic reticulum and the lysosome have to communicate in the factory because the uh, subgenomic RNA has to be moving to the rough endoplasmic reticulum for protein synthesis, and newly synthesized protein have to move back to the lysosome. So contacts are with these two types of interactions. It is not the same with the other organelles recruited there. For example, for Golgi, we have the Golgi stacks, 
they never surround the lysosome. They just touch in a very discreet spot. The vesicles of the periphery of the Golgi touch the lysosome. That must be enough for uh, the transfer of ribonucleoproteins for virus assembly. Just that. In mitochondria, we could never find interactions. So they are get very close, but there is always some fuzzy material in between, some molecules in between. We think these are P32. We have, do, we have done some immunolabeling. And P32 is a mitochondrial protein that is massively recruited inside the lysosome. We don't know why. We don't know the function of P32. But mitochondria get empty of this protein and all the protein moves inside the lysosome. So this must be part of the P32 that we are visualizing. Or, well, sometimes they are in front of these channels of the rigid membranes in communication with the cytosol. <coughs> So it seems that each recruited organelle interacts with a different way with the basic structure of the replication complex. So this is our working model now to, to keep working about how molecules could be moving around there. But uh, well, basically we know that the replicase is here and here and they are active in replication. Somehow the RNA has to be moving out towards the Golgi complex in some spots. And mitochondria must provide P32 and energy. This is what people say, that uh, ATP has to reach the replication complexes. We have also seen vimentin around, but we don't know if this is a real vimentin cage. We see vimentin, but we don't know why vimentin is there. Going back to the 3D view, I think that everybody understands that this is very complicated to understand. If we want to, to reach a macromolecular understanding of the structure, we have so many macromolecules around and inside the, the CPVs that we need assistance. We really need to, to apply methods of uh, identification of molecules if we want to go further and not just to see nice shapes in 3D. Okay? So the strategy of the group of Maumeister in, in the Max plan has been always the identification of proteins using the, morphologi the morphological pattern strategy. This means that if we know the high resolution structure of proteins by X-ray crystallography or cryomicroscopy, we could try to find these proteins in the, in the tomograms of the cell. This has been successful. This is a very interesting approach for very simplified systems. For example, they started with liposomes. They include into the liposomes two different type of proteins that they knew before by high resolution. They did the tomograms <coughs> and the processing programs could identify perfectly the two proteins. So this is a starting point. And also, as I showed you before, in the eukaryotic cells, in the amoeba, they could uh, find some of the proteins in the tomograms that they knew before by high resolution. This is a very ambitious goal. I mean, if we can just have a macromolecular map of a cell, if, if knowing all this, some proteins we want to study how they look like, how they interact in cells, that would be really a breakthrough. However, in any eukaryotic cell, this is what we have. When we applied high pressure freezing, high preservation methods, we go to the analysis of, for example, this is the assembly area of vaccinia virus. This is a mature virus. This is full of molecules, full of proteins. The cytosol is not the fluid without the structure. It has very high concentrations of protein, and all this protein is part of a structure. That means that our protein, even if we have and information about the high resolution of the structure will be interacting with many things in, in a live cell. And some structures we can say here, well, these are ribosomes, this is DNA being packaged. We have seen some microtubules, but what is the other elements is very difficult to identify. So we need to go to the traditional method of immunogol. I mean, immunolabeling methods are very useful for understanding the structures at least as a preliminary approach. And the thing is that immunoglobulins are very big. So we can just detect uh, epitopes on the surface of sections of a cell, or if we want to know more about the protein in the whole cell, we can permeabilize cells, okay? We can permeabilize uh, the plasma membrane to introduce the antibodies and to look for our protein inside the cells. This is facilitated by some other uh, probes used for correlative microscopy, such as fluoronanogold, or quantum dots that have just the part of the immunoglobulin that recognizes the epitope, the antigen, and it's bound to a probe that is both fluorescence <coughs> and electron dense. Then we can study 
our protein in the whole cell and then at the electron microscopy level we can see how proteins are located in the structure. But all of them have a, a problem if we really want to understand how a protein is uh, forming part of a life cell. That inside the cells proteins are uh, taking part in different types of interactions and once the protein is bound to some other proteins or some other structures the epitope we want to localize with the antibody could be masked and this, is, this happens all the time, we have to serve this all the time. So if we want to mm, eliminate this problem we need a clonable tag as GFP. So clonable tags for light microscopy, GFP and all the, the proteins related has been, uh, this protein, a real revolution in cell biology. You can follow the behavior of your protein in a live cell and without the limitations of antibodies. So some time ago, the electron microscopist wanted to find something similar to GFP. If we have a clonable tag for EM, we could, this is just, uh, this is not real, we just have placed here some spots to give an idea of what we want to do. You have your 3D reconstruction by serial sections of tomography and you can localize with these clonable tags, you could be able to see where your proteins are part of the structure without the limitation of an antibody being able to see the protein or not. So some time ago, uh, David de Rossier in Brandeis University in the States proposed together with Christopher Mercogliano that metal binding proteins could be good candidates for clonable tags. If I have a protein that binds a lot of metal ions, those can be electron dense, so uh, this can be used as a clonable tag for you. So they use this protein, this is metallothionine. This is a small protein of uh, just 6 kilodaltons, 60 amino acids, 4 or 5 times smaller than GFP. And this protein is not folded in the cell. The protein is just like a ribbon, no secondary structures, it's, it's one of the very few proteins with no structure at all, and it's a sensor of uh, heavy metals in a medium. So in eukaryotic cells, this protein binds, it has 20 cysteines, all of them bind one uh, atom of uh, mercury or gold, cadmium, whatever, and it falls, the protein falls around these uh, atoms of metal. So each atom of metal can bind more atoms and at the end you form a cluster of a metal that can be visualized by electron microscopy. And they demonstrated this. They fuse the metallothionine with maltose binding protein. This is an E. coli protein. They express the fusion protein in live bacteria, purified the protein and in vitro they treated the protein with gold salts. And they could visualize the formation of very small clusters. So this was a very good indication that this could work. So the question was, this could work in vivo, in a live cell. At that point, we were talking to them, so we can try, they, they were not cell biologists and they were working just with uh, the purified proteins and they were really nice. Uh, they sent us a lot of constructs for us to try in live E. coli. One of them was maltose binding protein bound to three copies of MT. Why three and not just one? Well, according to the size, they visualize uh, by regular microscopy of isolated proteins, they thought that, would, that uh, it would be impossible to localize just one. I mean, the particle was so small that we could not be able to see it in, inside a cell, okay, that have many other things around. So the first construct to try was this one, three copies of MT. This is E. coli, vitrified, alive. I mean, this is the culture, the bacteria are alive. We vitrify them. And this is the electron density of a bacteria, of a bacterium, just sectioned without any kind of staining or contrast agent. So this is the electron density of the molecules of the cell, okay? Then when the bacteria was expressed in MBPMT3 and treated with gold, gold chloride, we saw something weird. It's like the ribosomes were stained, but we were not applying any kind of staining. So looking at higher magnification, what we really have here is very small electron dense particles around the ribosomes. So this was the synthesis of the protein. So immediately after synthesis, it was becoming electron dense because it was capturing all the gold. So if we increase the concentration of the protein, the expression level, increasing the amount of IPTG, we could see a change in the pattern. So at the beginning we have the protein near the ribosomes, but then when we have really high concentrations of the protein, this protein 
is aggregating in the cell and we are visualizing the formation of inclusion bodies. The protein aggregates and then the clusters of call are bigger because many proteins are forming the cluster and we see bigger particles in almost all of them towards the cell periphery. So the, the bacterium was probably getting rid of the inclusion bodies, just moving them for secretion. But anyway, by uh, the use of antibodies, we could see that the particles were related to the two components of the chimera, MVP, MMT. But look at the efficiency of the antibodies. These are gold particles, colloidal gold particles. We are localizing many more uh, protein molecules with the tag. Okay? The second protein we tried was RIK. RIK is a DNA repair protein. It binds to DNA and repairs all the, the problems there. And this time it was fused with just one copy of MT, with not much hope of visualizing it because of the size of the particles. So in this case, we could see that the nucleoid of the cell becomes electron dense at low magnification. Looking at higher magnification, we could see many small particles, extremely small particles, but all of them in areas uh, with DNA. Uh, when we increased the concentration of the protein, we did not see any aggregation and moving towards the cell periphery. So we know now that if the protein is immobilized in a structure, either the cytoskeleton, DNA, or membrane, it does not form the clustering. It does not aggregate and move out. And some of the particles were like linearly arranged, and some of these linear arrays were really long. Here, just a drawing to show. So here, we really believe we are visualizing RIK interacting with the DNA fiber in vivo. And the third protein we tried at this moment was MIC. This is one of the last proteins that forms the division ring of E. coli. When the bacteria uh, are going to divide, the constriction of the ring incorporates many proteins, and this is one of the last proteins that goes there. So there was a fusion with GFP that showed that in non-dividing cells, the protein is in the periplasm, and most of the protein is on the poles. Looking at the empty fusion, we could see that the periplasm is full of the protein and some of the protein is aggregated, but the biggest aggregates are on the poles of the bacteria. In dividing cells, the GFP fusion shows that the protein goes to the constriction of the division ring. And by EM, we could see these are two serial sections of the same bacterium. The aggregates of the protein are in the constriction of the division ring. Here they look like floating, but they are in the periplasm, the things that we are not staining, and when we stain the bacteria, the line of the outer membrane comes here, outside, okay? But these are the aggregates of AMIC as part of the division ring. So the conclusion of this work is that three proteins, three E. coli proteins, whose function and localization was already described were localized where they should be to uh, develop their function after fusion with MT, okay? We could see extremely uh, small clusters. This, wa this was a real surprise. Just one nanometer or, or smaller. Here, for example, this is a 10 nanometer colloidal gold particle, and you can see that we distinguish much smaller particles, something like one nanometer or half a nanometer. And another good thing is that they are visualized in three dimensions by electron tomography. So when vitrifying the whole bacteria, we could make electron tomograms and to see how the proteins, the, the single molecules, were placed in three dimensions. A fourth protein, just to show something very interesting when we compare two antibodies. This is HFQ. This is a protein related to the RNA metabolism and it is known that it goes to the nucleoid. So we saw the protein in the nucleoid, but also in some other locations that were not expected okay, for this protein. And if we look, if we compare two antibodies, for example, this is the uh, immunolocalization of the protein, well, the two components of the fusion protein on cryosections, that is the best way to localize uh, proteins in cells because the preservation is very good in cryosections. So we have a good labeling, but even we, when we can visualize the two membranes, the outer membrane and the inner membrane, because they are white lines, they are very well distinguished. We couldn't say if the protein is outside or inside or in both layers. It's not, it's not possible. We don't have resolution. Why? Because immunocomplexes are big. The primary antibody together with the secondary antibody and the gold spheres could be something like 20 nanometers. And membranes are five nanometers thick, so we cannot assign the localization. Look at the tag, the empty tag we can say that the protein is in both layers. 
the inner membrane, which is the plasma membrane, and the outer layer. But we even see units of the protein moving to one layer to another. So this, this resolution in cells is really very, uh, is outstanding. And well, we think that in bacteria, probably this method is going to, to give a lot of information about the dynamics of proteins in cells. But do not forget that we developed this method to localize virus proteins in eukaryotic cells. So, okay, it works in bacteria and that's nice, but we would like to make it work in eukaryotic cells. And this is a completely different story because eukaryotic cells cannot adapt to the presence of uh, metal. They die. I mean, uh, bacteria adapt and they grow well, but not eukaryotic cells. So we have to apply either a very short treatment with cold salts or to permeabilize the plasma membrane, just the plasma membrane, to introduce the gold for a very few minutes. We cannot apply hours of treatment because cells would die, okay? So we did the testing with some plasmids before going into virus factories. And this is a replicase of uh, rubella virus fused with GFP and MT for correlative microscopy. This uh, expression uh, does not generate virus factories, just filaments, okay? The replicase expressed from a plasmid forms this kind of uh, filaments. If we apply correlative microscopy and choose just some areas of the cell, we could see that, yes, we found a method to make the proteins electron dense in cells. So we, saw, we could see the clusters in these filaments. We section these filaments and direct antibodies against them. And we could, again, we see all these particles of rather homogeneous size in the filaments and they are related to our fusion protein. So we have a method. And then we have moved into the uh, replicates that builds replication complexes and factories, I mean, in the modified lysosomes. And to our surprise, very early after transfection with a replicon that contains the replicase NMT, the protein is in the cell surface. The replication complex first uh, assembles on the cell surface and is active according to the signal of double-stranded RNA antibodies. And these complexes are just these small bubbles in some areas of the surface. You can see here the units. Uh, sometimes we distinguish fibers that within these are RNA molecules that the complex is building on RNA, as you can see here. Some areas are really extends of uh, replicates. And then we can see that here, in the absence of any kind of a staining, just to see the clusters, that the protein is endocytosed and it builds what it is going to be a replication complex of the lysosome with the rough endoplasmic reticulum and all the elements around. So again, the antibodies help us to understand that the clusters are just related to our fusion protein. We see something very strange, that the very large sheets of the replicates in the membrane are endocytosed and form part of the structure. And then what we are doing now is trying to understand the patterns of the molecules inside, because we see many different things. We see lines of the proteins in the membrane. We see this kind of rings. We see circles. And we see also what we believe are the two-dimensional arrays of the replicases in the rigid membranes. But to understand much more how this is placed in 3D and how this works, we are moving into electron tomography and image processing. This is the, the moment we are uh, at the moment, we are doing this work <coughs> to know if we really have a pseudo crystal there, if the molecules change. What is true is that on the cell surface, the proteins are not organized in two dimensional arrays, but they are functional. They are replicating already. And when they become part of the CPV, they organize much more and they are functional. So we don't know what is uh, triggering the, the function, but different organizations can be functional in replication. So we are also moving to this replicon that has GFP and MT for correlative microscopy. And our idea is to find, OK, the earliest structure that we can visualize in live cell doing correlative microscopy. We study the structure, how the CPV and the whole factory is, is organizing there, and then to analyze how the molecules are forming a functional factory. This is what we are trying to do. And this is all. Uh, the laboratory, as I said at the beginning, is part of the National Center for Biotechnology in Madrid. And this is the people in my group who have done all the work I show here. Elia Diestra and Juan Fontana are two postdoctoral fellows. And Noelia, Laura, Eva and Sandra are PhD students. And we have a lot of work from the confocal unit 
Silvia Gutierrez is an outstanding confocal live cell microscopy unit. In Barcelona, we do a lot of work with high pressure freezing and electron tomography acquisition with Dr. Carmen Lopez Iglesias. And all the image processing, we will not be able to do it without the help of Jose Jesus Fernandez. He's a big expert of image processing in biology from proteins to viruses <coughs> to cells. And of course, a special thanks to Terry Fried and Richard Elliott because they provide all the molecular tools that we are using to, to study our factories. So this is all. Thank you for your attention.